Welcome to the uh, SETI Institute's URSA Student Final Talks. So the URSA program stands for Undergraduate Research at the SETI Institute in Astrobiology. It's an academic year research partnership between the SETI Institute and San Jose State. So this year we have four amazingly fabulous students from San Jose State who have worked very hard with us since last August um, on a variety of projects that you'll get to hear today. And these are presentations that they gave at the National Conference on Undergraduate Research earlier this year in Wisconsin. And I asked them to come and give them here to an audience, a local audience here at the SETI Institute, since most of us didn't get to travel to Wisconsin to see the talks there. So we'll hear four presentations today. Um, our first presentation is by Shital Patel, and she's going to come on up. After each presentation, we will have the, um, the next person will follow after them. We'll have the first two talks, then we'll have a break for questions on the first two, then we'll have our second two talks and a break for questions on those. So let me welcome our first speaker. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Chital and I am actually working with Janice Bishop and we do surface composition work and so today I'll be sharing with you the fabulous project that we've been working on which is the mineralogical and chemical analyses of the Antarctic Dry Valley sediments as potential analogs for Mars. It's not, okay. okay, so first I would like to start off by giving you a little information on the dry valleys and so they allow us to um, they give us a study environment to, so that we can um, examine the sediment weathering and alterations that are happening in the dry environment and they are shaped by glaciers mountains ice covered lakes and then there's seasonal melt streams so why are they why could they be used as analogs for Mars well the two main characteristics is the fact that they are um, is part of a dry and cold environment and that is suitable to study because Mars has similar physical properties like that and there's also limited uh, surface water and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find water on the surface of Antarctica or the dry valleys and then see what kind of mineralogy and chemistry is occurring there. Um, previous studies have been done and it's been done in the Taylor Valley so it's at the bottom of Lake Hoar and so the sediments there have been studied and currently the project that I worked on had to do with a core sample that was near Don Juan Pond and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Okay, so I'd first like to tell you, I'd like to show you where the Antarctic dry valleys are. So here is Antarctica and then here's our study location right there. And so if you look here, here are the dry valleys and so they're, they're it's made of um, or there are several valleys that are part of it, and the one that we've been studying is the Wright Valley. And so the Wright Valley is right here. And so a little bit more background information. Um, it's an extreme aqueous habitat. Having said that, Antarctica takes up 90% of the world's ice. That's a huge percentage. Based on that, 0.32% of the continent is actually ice-free, and that's where the dry valleys come in. Um, the sediments from the dry valleys are, um, of Antarctica, they, as I mentioned before, they offer a distinct study environment because of the extreme conditions, it being dry and very cold. And so the chemistry and mineralogy are being studied. Another interesting fact is that micro, it has been found that microbial organisms thrive in the lake bottom sediments in regions with or without oxygen. Okay, so here's a contour map of the Wright Valley. And so, the, the, my study location is right here, Don Juan Core 39. And so if you look here, this black spot right here, that's, uh, that's Don Juan Pond, and it is a hypersaline lake. Hypersaline meaning it's a landlocked body of water that has a high concentration of salt compared to that of seawater. So I showed you maps. Now I'd like to show you photographs so you can see what kind of environment we're dealing with. So if you look here, this is the Wright Valley, and so it is located on the eastern flank of the Transarctic um, Antarctic Mountains, and so it runs two kilometers along its width, and um, here is, this photograph right here is of Don Juan Pond, and then right here is Core 39, 
And so a core is a plastic tube that's pushed into the ground so that we can collect samples along a certain depth, and then we can see what kind of chemistry and mineralogy is occurring there. OK, so now for the fun stuff. This is what I do in lab. So I made a collage of the sample preparation that I did right here. And so before I came into the lab, there were samples that, there was a lot of samples that were frozen and thawed out. And then they were collected in core samples of one to two centimeter intervals. And so we did, that was done so that we can see what kind of chemistry is happening at each, like within each centimeter along its depth. And so after that, so here are my samples, and they're all color coordinated because they were collected from different, um, from the outskirts, outskirts of Don Juan Pond and all along Wright Valley. But mine are like in the green. And so I have 25 vials, and the reason why is because it, some of them were, I actually have 23, and so they were um, collected at increments of 0 to 1, and then towards the end it was 2 centimeters. Um, and so what I did was I grinded, and I, I used a mortar and pestle to grind them, and the reason, the reason why we did that is because we're sending them to um, other laboratories for chemistry, um, for chemical testing, and so we... I grind them with mortar pestle, and then I dry sieve them and collected fractions of less than 125 microns. And we did that to homogenize the sample so that there's consistency in data measurements. OK, the next part of what I did in lab is measuring reflectance spectroscopy. So here's me measuring um, reflectance of my samples. And so basically, I used a field spec pro spectrometer. And the way this works is a solar simulated radiation is shined on the sample, and then there's two wires that are coming from this detector. So one will shine the light, and another one will collect whatever is reflected from the sample. And so whatever is reflected is what's being measured. OK, so I just gave you a brief sentence on what, how reflectance spectroscopy works. But here's a schematic representation. And so here's radiation that's simulated from my wire, and then it shines onto a sample. The sample can either transmit, absorb, or reflect. And so whatever is reflected is collected by an, the detector from another wire. And then from there, I can generate a spectra using kaleidographs. And so the reason why we're doing this is because there are mineral fingerprints and that, that are characteristics of certain peaks. And we can determine what kind of minerals are in our samples. And then from there, we could see what kind of, what kind of mineralogy is occurring as you go down the depth. OK, so we're focused on weathering. So if there's water present, there's going to be chemical weathering occurring. And so our main focus when we were um, analyzing the spectra was on water bands and hydroxide bands. And so here's a water band right here. And then there's a hydroxide band, these small bands after it. And so I did band center calculations where I measured, um, where I determined how much water is being absorbed. Um, for each sample, and then from there we can tell where most of the chemistry is probably occurring down the depth. So before that, we also noticed that there were um, there were some peaks that were characteristics of certain minerals, and so clays and sulfates are alteration minerals. So we focused our project on clays and sulfates, and so here are some characteristics of what uh, you see with clays. There's a water band um, from 1.91 to 1.92, which is a, a narrow range. And then there's a hydroxide band that, are, uh, that correspond to certain uh, elements um, occurring near 2.2 and 2.3. And then sulfate has a longer wavelength, so it's from 1.94 to 1.98. And then there's a drop off in reflectance, uh, so you'll see a decrease along around 2.4 to 2.5 microns. Okay. I know those are a bunch of numbers, so I have a plot here that shows what kind of um, characteristics you'd see for clays and sulfates. So if you look here for clays, there was a 2.2 and 2.3 hydroxide bands that correspond to aluminum and iron. And then there's a water band that's around 1.91, 1.92. And then for sulfates, you could see a water band that's around 1.95, 1.96. And then there's a decrease in reflectance um, past 2.4. So I looked at, after I plotted all my um, samples, I tried to see which ones came close to sulfates or clays based on these characteristics. Um, also, before I actually um, 
divulged into comparing lab spectra, we noticed that a few centimeters along the depth, we saw the highest water absorption. And also, we had data, we had chemistry data um, that showed that there's a high salt concentration um, in the same region where we saw high water absorption. So from there, we we figured that there might be some sort of chemistry, or the majority of the chemistry and mineralogical um, processes are occurring in that region, which is below the surface, which we thought was a little interesting. OK, so now comes the spectral matches. So I, what I did was I took um, alophane, gypsum, and montmorillonite, which is alophane's a clay. It's a weathering product of volcanic ash. and then Gypsum is a sulfate, um, and it's a uh, typical evaporite deposit. So these are all these all interact with uh, water molecules in some way. And then we have uh, montmorillonite, which is also an aluminum-rich clay. Um, what we noticed from here was that gypsum and alophane came pretty close to my samples. If you see here, if you just follow the water bands um, and the hydroxide band. Uh, Montmorillonite Mont didn't come as close, and, but I just wanted to put that up there to show some contrast with the uh, spectral matches. And so from here, we can tell that there is a clay and there is a sulfate, some sort of sulfate present in my samples. So there is some sort of alteration occurring. Okay, I have this plot up to show variability along the sample depth. And so if you see here, olivine and pyroxene, they're primary silicates. And so these have broad, really broad bands. And I have this up there because although they don't match exactly with my um, spectra, there is, this indicates that there's a weak abundance of it, but there's still some presence. So that's why I have it up there. And these all are along the depth. I mean, along the depth. So there is, there, it fluctuates um, as to how, based on how broad it is here. OK, my final analyses, um, what I did was I took two bar graphs. And I have water absorption here along the depth. And then I have ion abundance here along its depth here. And then I have the photograph of a core sample, of my core sample. And so what I did here was I wanted to show you or give you a better idea as to what kind of, uh, how we can correlate water abundance and ion abundance with the photograph. So if you see by these two arrows, these bright sediments, uh, they correlate with um, high water and high salt concentration. And as you go down the depth, you, it kind of gets a little dark. And then this side, although it's bright, I think there might be something wrong with the photograph. But you can clearly see a band right here. Um, and then it just decreases as you go down. OK. Today I shared with you my study, which was on Don Juan Pond Core 39. And we are using that as good Martian an analogs because, like, because of cold and dry environments. And um, also because it can give us some insight on what to look for and where to look for in terms of future uh, missions to on Mars. And then there are alteration. We studied alteration minerals, sulfates, and clays. And then um, the primary minerals that are present are quartz, feldspar, and pyroxene. These are based on previous studies. And we studied alteration mineralogy, as I mentioned before. Um, we focused on gypsum and alophane. And the region, the most interesting part about my project was the fact that we saw uh, alteration occurring a few centimeters below the surface as opposed to the top, because that's the one that's exposed to the environment or the atmosphere. So that was the interesting thing. Um, and then, therefore, most chem active chemistry is occurring there. And then the presence of al alophane indicates that there's limited soil maturity. Um, so there's more physical as opposed to chemical weathering occurring. And so if we can see this kind of alteration occurring here, we could possibly be seeing that on Mars. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, and if it wasn't for these three wonderful people, I would not be here giving this presentation. And I would just like to thank them for all their support. And I'm so glad to be here. We'll do our next one, and then we'll take questions on
Hello everyone, my name is Greta Sukrov and today I'll be telling you how, how I was using stereo photogrammetry to create digital elevation models of planetary surfaces as part of my project at SETI Institute. So first I'll tell you about who I am, then I'll tell you a little bit about what are we trying to what we try to accomplish with Cynthia Phillips here at SETI Institute. I'll tell you a little bit about what stereo photogrammetry is all about and what are the digital, digital elevation models. Then I'll spend a little bit more time explaining how I what techniques I was using to create one. And then I'll tell you how they're useful in our research. And um, lastly, I'll tell you about the results and what kind of problems we encountered in our work. So as Dr. Phillips already mentioned, I'm part of URSA program. And Dr. Monica Kress and her are responsible for that program, which is funded by NASA. Um, I'm an undergraduate uh, student majoring in physics, majoring in physics at San Jose State University, and Dr. Kress is my undergraduate uh, advisor. So Dr. I was paired up uh, with Dr. Cynthia Phillips, and um, she's extremely interested in active geological processes uh, on planets. And she's an expert in spacecraft image processing. And so we are using these um, uh, tech, uh, remote sensing techniques to extract useful data from images for further analysis. One of the techniques is called stereophotogrammetry. And um, first things first, let's an analyze what the words mean. Stereo means three-dimensional, something solid. Photo means um, image, uh, photo means light, gram means drawing, and metry means measurement. So now you have an idea of what photogrammetry is. It's basically a process where you take measurements from a picture that depicts a 3D object. Uh, so um, um, they're used to obtain uh, uh, spatial measurements and determine dimensions, shapes, and spatial, spatial positions of objects of a planetary surface. And they're usually um, uh, the, process, uh, the process generates um, uh, models containing terrain elevation and heights of heights of objects on plan planet's surface. So here's an example of uh, Laguna Negra Lake in, that is located in Chile. And these lines um, transect the lake. And uh, these are the graphs that represent uh, these uh, transects. They show height versus distance. Um, and they tell you how high are the mountains surrounding the lakes. The only reason why I was able to extract this information was because I already had a digital, nice looking digital elevation model available to me. And it's very important to have uh, digital elevation models because they hold basic elevation data, information about slope and um, aspect. And they're used to create digital maps. So they're also used um, for mission planning and targeting purposes. An example of how um, uh, this was used was um, by Natalie Co Dr. Natalie Cabral, who works at SETI Institute as a principal investigator. And she used the data I gave her, these plots, to design a mission um, to Laguna Negra. Um, because she's interested in technologies that one day could be used to explore the hydro hydrocarbon lakes on Saturn's moon Titan. So um, digital elevation models of Earth um, and the data that is extracted from them are really useful, as you just saw from this example. But how do we use uh, digital elevation models um, for pl um, planets? Um, so one of the um, applications of that is to study crater relaxation. And um, so uh, scientists observe that over time, over a billion years, the craters relax. So they flatten, like you see in this picture. And there are numerous um, studies that study how long does it take for the crater to relax. And what we are doing is we are providing current we are trying to provide current, current depth of the craters. And this data, extracting the DM, DMs, will allow us to measure the current depth of craters and compare them to the models of crater relaxation that exist. 
So now that we understand the importance of digital elevation, digital elevation models, let's understand how one is actually being made. First, we have to find images of the desired surface. Then we have to process them with special processing software called ISIS-3. Um, it's a planetary image processing software. Um, only then we can load the images into a main photogrammetric so um, software called SocketSet. Um, then we um, spend countless hours trying to measure tie points um, that are basically found in the overlap region of the two images. And if everything goes well at the end, we can export a DM of the overlap area. So step one, find images. Um, it's, a, um, it's one of the most important parts to find very good overlapping images. Um, be, um, so photogrammetry requires overlapping aerial photographs in order to obtain uh, stereo image pairs over the same area. And to do that, I used JMR's application. Uh, this is the screenshot of it. And here um, you can ask the application to give all the overlapping images that were taken with Galileo spacecraft. As you can see, for example, this, these are overlapping and these are overlapping. So I would basically download the ones that we were interested in. This is a cartoon image of spacecraft taking a stereo images of a desired surface. The second uh, step is to process them in ISIS software, as I just mentioned. And here, all we do is we use already available Perl scripts to process uh, the images so they are readable. And it's just cut and dry process, but it's really important to not make a mistake because a minute uh, co unnecessary comma or space can just stall the process. Um, the most important part is uh, um, done in socket set software. As I said, this is the main photogrammetry software. And here I have to at least find eight type points. And as you can see, I zoomed in on a crater and I was trying to put two images right on top of each other. So there is 100% a, a overlap. Here's a screenshot of socket set. Uh, you can see I'm trying to overlap this region with this image, this part right here with this, or this image with this one. Um, it's Sometimes it's really hard if the resolution is not the same, as you can see right here. This is me at my photogrammetric workstation. Uh, to do the type point measurements, I have to wear 3D glasses. So I'm not just trying to appear cool. And as I said, if everything goes well, you export the DEM. This is a DEM of a creator of Saturn's moon Tethys. It's, it was my first DEM, so you can see the quality is not that great. Um, some of the problems that I encountered was only due to the software. It would just crash on me for unknown reasons. And we were working with uh, the help part, um, people who would help us out to avoid these. Um, so one of the areas that Dr. F uh, Phillips was interested in was these chaos terrain features on Jupiter's moon Europa. And uh, for some reason, because of we don't know what it's, why I wasn't able to create a DM because of the images or because of the software. I was never actually able to create a DM of these features. Um, the only DM that I was able to extract of Europa was of this crater um, called Mananan. And um, again, Ar ArcGIS software was used to uh, extract um, topographic data. Uh, from this crater, as you can see right here, height versus distance. It still ha needs some work, uh, but that was my last day at SETI, so I couldn't go any further with that. Um, future work, um, we were looking at the chaos terrains, as I mentioned to you before. Um, so maybe one day we can still look at the overlap regions of those chaos terrain features and make a, 
nice looking VM of those parts. And hopefully the results will be compared to the theoretical models of the formation of these features and how they change over time. And at the very least, this work can also identify the important targets for future Euro Europa spacecraft images. I, I mean, so sorry, spacecraft missions. And I just wanted to acknowledge all these people that helped me um, to do my work here at SETI. I couldn't have done um, this without them. Thank you very much. For either Greta or Chital? No? Yes? Yeah, let, let me give you the microphone. Hang on. A question for Chital. You mentioned that you um, uh, ground your sample and then you sieved it and you did a size fractionation where you excluded the sort of 150 micron size. Um, do you think that, and then later on, you showed a comparison? of, um, I believe it might have been olivine as a reference material. Do you think you may have done some size exclusion? And do you think that maybe your larger fraction uh, might have been a different material than what you were actually measuring? Um, so the, when I measured the spectra, I didn't take any measurements of the, the samples that were I should have, if I did the, if I measured it with the 125 microns, I probably could have seen something different. So that could have been a factor. I should have probably compared. No, no, no. I meant, but like, I see what you're, what you mean, though. Thank you for your talk, by the way, both of you guys. Um, so how far was the activity that you found underneath the surface, the chemical activity? OK, so the core sample was 25 centimeters in depth. Um, what we noticed that the activity was occurring near 3 to 8 centimeters. Because then after that, the water absorption just got really less. And so did the chemistry. And do you know if that's um, some sort of geochemical activity due to biological or non-biological reasons? Thank that you. Is, that it is a possibility. I just haven't looked into it. But that, that, is, that could be an interesting reason. You could see from my bathroom. Future work. Yep. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Joanna Yi Kim Chan, and um, I'm working with Alex Breitenbach and uh, Dr. Richard Quinn on the OREO project, um, which stands for Organics Exposure in Orbit. Um, this is with affiliation with SETI Institute, um, NASA Ames, and San Jose State. So the objective that we have for OREOs is um, preparing samples for the OREO Cube International Space Station experiment, where we actually put samples um, <clears throat> in outer space. Um, this is to investigate the chemistry of organic and mineral surfaces exposure to space radiation. Um, so the samples that we have, um, they're going to be in these really small hermetically sealed reaction cells. These are about a centimeter across, so they're really small. Um, they consist of two optical windows, magnesium fluoride window, and um, 
uh, aluminum window. Uh, thin film mineral substrates will be applied to them. And also organic samples too. Um, <clears throat> these, like I said, are hermetic hermetically sealed, so there actually will be gas inside or um, Mars like to be inside here, kind of like a Mars atmosphere, kind of mimicking the Mars atmosphere. And then we will measure any changes that occur with spectroscopy, like Chatal had just mentioned, um, except instead of reflectance, we use absorbance. Um, <clears throat> so these are for um, the experiment that's going into the International Space Station. They'll have the cells that um, are on a carousel, and um, about 24 samples fit onto the carousel itself. Uh, sunlight will be used to measure the thin films because it will be on outer space. And um, the fiber optics are coupled to the spectrometer for measurement. So it would be really, really small. The, um, what we get would be kind of the absorbance. It's kind of measured um, with a spectrometer. Um, this is the mass that we use in the lab. It's about four inches across, and it holds about 52 samples. This has a cutout, so it holds slightly less number of cells. And the optical window, like we showed before, is just about a centimeter across. The thin films, <clears throat> organics, uh, are deposited on the optical window using vacuum sublimation. Um, so for the laboratory sample testing, um, we use this photochemical cell here. Um, um, as you can see, the mask fits right inside, and um, to simulate the solar radiation, we use a xenon arc lamp. Um, <clears throat> and during the solar exposure, um, we keep it at a relatively um, stable pressure and temperature over the course of how many hours or days we choose to expose it for. Um, <clears throat> so this kind of coincides with like Mars Science Laboratory. Um, the reason why we choose it to be at that particular pressure and that particular temperature over the course of time is because it's similar to that of like Mars atmosphere. Um, also, we choose to use iron oxide such as hematite magnetite because the Mars soil consists about 18% of that. Um, so this can be, this is like a precursor to anything that they can possibly do further Mars research and things of that. Um, so uh, my study mainly focuses on tryptophan. Uh, tryptophan has a chirality, which means it also has a mirror image, kind of like your left and your right hand. Um, the life that we have here on Earth mainly utilizes the L-tryptophan. So because of that, we see that there's a big ratio difference between the L and the D-tryptophan. <clears throat> Um, this can be an indicator of life if the ratio is very different, whether it be L or D is higher or lower. If there's a huge difference in the percentage and ratio of the, um, for the mirror images themselves, that can be an indicator that life exists somewhere. So we kind of use that as maybe if there are equal amounts, that could be a possibility that there is no life. So for <clears throat> the Mars simulation here, we have uh, tryptophan. Tryptophan um, I found to be pretty interesting just because of how fast it degrades. Um, as you can see in the red, um, that's the tryptophan prior to any exposure. In the 200 region, you see a high peak, and then another peak at the 300 region, the 300 nanometer absorbance. Um, that's very telltale of the tryptophan. Um, and you can see just within five hours, which is the green line here, how much it degrades with just five hours of exposure. And then after 10 hours and then 300 or so hours, it's just not even there anymore. Um, we also do tryptophan and, and iron oxide together. So here we have hematite. And with hematite, um, you can see that there's a characteristic within the 400 region. And with the hematite and tryptophan together, you can see both characteristics of the tryptophan with the 200 nanometer region, 300 nanometer region, and then the hematite within that too, 400 nanometer region. And then the tryptophan on hematite <clears throat> over the course of time 
you can see how fast that tryptophan degrades after even just five hours. That's not, almost not even there anymore. But the hematite, which is at the 400 area, is still there, and you can see it even after 100 hours. Um, this is the same thing with tryptophan and magnetite. The magnetite, um, you can really see that there's this large characteristic right over here, and that's true for the tryptophan, how it degrades again very, very rapidly over time. So the conclusion we have, um, the UV decomposition of tryptophan under Mars condition is very rapid. Even just after five hours, it's almost like it completely, not completely gone, but most of the characteristics are gone. Um, so the primary data doesn't show any rate increase with the iron oxides because we see that the, we almost get the same kind of results even with uh, hematite and magnetite on it. Um, we believe that maybe water may play a critical role, but that kind of just, we're not really sure that. We, we can make future experiments towards anything like that. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Richard Quinn, uh, Cynthia Phillips, and Monica Crest for helping me with uh, giving me this opportunity to do this. So, any questions? Hello? Oui. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alex Breitenbach. I'm here to talk to you uh, about my research with Joanna Chan, uh, working under Dr. Richard Quinn on organic compound degradation in space. Uh, this is, uh, first I'd like to give a little o overview of the project. It's called Oreo Cube for Organic Exposure in Orbit. It's going to be a scientific experiment done on the International Space Station. It's a joint effort between the European Space Agency and NASA. Uh, during this presentation, I'll go over uh, the objectives of what we hope to research in it. Uh, I'm going to go over the Oreo Cube flight hardware and also going to touch on some of the ground control studies that we've currently done and are going to continue going on into the summer. The, so our main interest is we want to know how organic compounds are interacting with minerals and specifically how they're interacting with those minerals in sp space environments. Uh, this can be planetary surfaces such as Mars or on the surface or inside comets or even in an interstellar medium. This is a photo of a previous flight hardware, but we're going to be mimicking it. Uh, it's a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube package. On top, the white disc is a carousel with 24 sample cells that will be rotating around. You can see the small little black aperture on the top, your left. Uh, that uh, uh, is where light will come through, pass through the cell, and hit through uh, the spectrometer, which is located underneath that aperture. Uh, when this is installed up on the International Space Station, it will use the light from the sun both for its exposure, of course, and also for its measurements. Close-up photo of the sample cell. It's a 9 millimeters uh, diameter. Uh, the body is stainless steel. The thin window here at the bottom is alumina. The top is going to be magnesium fluoride. And on the inside of the magnesium fluoride window will be the thin films. Uh, first, touching the magnesium fluoride will be a thin film of the, or of the mineral that we're interested in looking at. And then on top of that will be the organic material. Uh, and some tests, of course, will just be the organic material so we have some sort of control so we know it's an actual interaction taking place between the mineral and the organic compound. How we're getting the organic compound on there. Uh, I myself am not doing any of the uh, mineral depositing, so I can't talk about that. But as far as the organic deposit, uh, we place, they have another mask up here on the top here. We place all the windows in this top. In the bottom down here, where it's hard to see, there's a cup where we can place our uh, organic material. We put this uh, into a closed chamber, put it under vacuum, and heat up that cup, which allows the uh, Sample material goes from straight from solid to a gas. That's the sublimation. And then uh, these cables up here run a coolant up here. It keeps this disk nice and cool. 
and where that gas can go straight from a gas back to a solid on the windows, and that's deposition. The current ground control studies that we're doing involves the minerals of magnetite and hematite. A little photo of Mars in the bottom left there uh, is orangish red, and that's due to hematite, which is a majority of the material on the surface. Uh, magnetite is also known to be uh, on Mars, has been found in many meteorites that have hit Earth that have come from Mars. Uh, tryptophan, as Joe talked to you earlier, is one of the 22 essential amino acids uh, that we're studying. Also, we're studying ad adenine, which is a nucleobase. We got adenine, guanine, thionine, and uracil, the essential for our DNA. And then we have antherufrin, which I will focus on. It's a quinone, and I'll get into that in a moment. So for antherufrin, why we're wanting to study that? Uh, antherufrin comes from polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. It's actually one of many uh, quinones uh, that is a result of organic degradation or radiation degradation of polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbons leads to quinones, uh, antherufrin being one of those quinones. So quinone molecules uh, it's a class of molecule that are derived from the aromatic compound to have an even number of carbon-oxygen double bonds, or ketone functional groups. We're interested in antherufrin as just one potential quinone due to the class sim similarity being a quinone, and also due to the chromophores or the pi orbital bonds, the, both the carbon-carbon double bond and the carbon-oxygen double bond gives unique signatures during UV, vis, and IR spectrometry for us to be able to gauge how the molecules are interacting over time exposure. Right now we're currently doing many studies that are simulating the Mars atmosphere uh, with, uh, exposure to these uh, windows. Uh, basically in this chamber here we call it a con flask. Uh, there are many windows that are kind of hard to see but uh, these ones are silicon oxide windows that have thin film organics and minerals deposited on the surface and we are flowing through carbon dioxide at about 5 millibar uh, and a uh, temperature similar to Mars as well, one of the temperatures that Mars is experiencing in the universe. And we hit it with UV light generated from a xenon arc lamp. Just a quick photo of how we take the measurements. We have an XY stage here on the bottom. We place our mask right here and we can feed it between the top here and the bottom here. Uh, a, the spectrometer light source comes through, passes through our sample, and goes to a spectrometer collector in the back in the uh, blurry section there you can see the deposition chamber. Now these are some graphs that are produced from the spectrometer. Of the red on both are combined with anthrodermum in the mineral. The left graph is going to be uh, bottom here, bottom dotted line is just anthrodermum. The thick dotted line is just hematite and then the red is hematite and antherufrin combined. Likewise, on the right, it's going to be the thick dotted is magnetite, and the thick red is magnetite and antherufrin combined. Uh, I just provided a, uh, for, for the purposes of this, only uh, hematite and magnetite. Uh, we did many graphs showing that they did not change over time, so I won't get into that. It'll just be showing you the same thing over and over again. But as far as for antherufrin, it did change over time. At zero hours of exposure to the UV radiation, we have a sharp peak just below 300 and a sharp peak around 220. The peak just below 300 is due to the carbon-oxygen double bond, and the peak around 220 is due to the carbon-carbon double bonds. As you can see, uh, over time exposure, it degraded, although it degraded quite a bit slower than tryptophan, it did just the same. Here we have a, like a similar graph with hematite and antherufrin. Again, it's degrading over time, as you can see. We also have broad spectrum, just below 400 to maybe about 430. Uh, that shows the color of antherufrin. It's a yellowish-red color as it's absorbing the purple-blue range. Again, magnetite and antherufrin. So this is hematite and antherufrin, and it's degrading over time. And magnetite and antherufrin is also degrading over time. 
we predicted to, that the magnetite in anthropyrin would degrade more. Uh, we haven't delved into the statistics of the data just yet, but uh, so far we've shown, shown that the actual peaks at 300 and 220 degrade slightly slower for the magnetite in uh, anthropyrin than with the hematite in anthropyrin. And this is something very interesting as uh, magnetite was definitely expected to be a stronger catalyst for the degradation that we we're hoping to see. So just a little sum up, this uh, talking about the Oreo cube, organic exposure in space. It's a uh, scientific experiment that will be t taking place on the International Space Station. Uh, hopefully sometime next year we're going to be preparing a bunch of the samples this summer, hopefully all of them this summer, to get it up there. And we're interested in studying the organic interaction with the mineral substrates. And we're currently doing the ground control studies, and it's an ongoing process. I wanted to give a special thanks to Dr. Cynthia Phillips and Dr. Monica Kress for giving me the opportunity here at SETI and to work under Richard and really exposed me to a whole new world that I didn't think I'd ever be a part of and I'm very happy to be a part of. Uh, I have also a lot of peers here with the Oreo Cube team, um, most of which I will meet this summer. I haven't met them yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions for the last two talks for Joanna or for Alex? Hi, Alex. Um, did you uh, have any idea of how your experiment is going to fly up? Is it probably going to go up in a dragon, or what was uh, what was the go there? I, I have not had any uh, part of the decision making and how it's going up there. I believe a FedEx is working on uh, <laughs> rockets right now, or maybe a Virgin Mobile. <laughs> so. Um, to answer the question, sort of, the <laughs> e ESA has taken the responsibility to, to get it to the space station. The details haven't been worked out. Right now, um, there's a contract out um, to a European company to build the actual spectrometer system, and the build is a uh, build to print based on what we had built here um, at NASA Ames a couple of years ago for a satellite mission. So we don't know exactly how it's going to get up there other than uh, it's on the manifest for the ESA uh, space station experiments. Um, either of you, or, or maybe Richard, when this flies on the space station, what is the hypothesis that it's testing? You want the null set? or? <laughs> So uh, with maybe some corrections from Richard, but um, as far as what I've talked with Richard on many discussions, uh, specifically with my studying of anthro um, the quinones through uh, with the Mars simulator, is we know that organic material is being deposited on Mars. Uh, it's getting bombarded all the time, but so far we haven't found any traces of that organic material. So we're interested in the time frame at which it de degrades, or, uh, specifically uh, in the environment of space, I guess. Yeah. There's a lot of objectives. Um, ESA has a long history of doing space exposure experiments, uh, Biopan, Biopan 2, where they put a whole suite of materials up, uh, biological, chemical, and look at space radiation effects. Um, they've had in the past difficulty reconciling their space observations with their laboratory studies. One of the reasons um, we believe is that they're doing a, because it's a passive experiment, they do a, a point in time analysis before and then when they return. Um, what we're doing is we're sending the spectrometers up there so we can get real time kinetic studies of what's happening to these samples with with time. So in part, um, it's a technology demonstration that expands on a long history of, of space radiation exposures. Uh, the materials, part of their, their task was to determine, you know, what are the best materials to, to study 
um, both in terms of the constraints of the technology and also in terms of interesting uh, simulations, Mars, Mars radiation, comets. Um, so a whole suite of, of things are being evaluated. And um, we've got uh, Devin here and Griffin here. They're also uh, been working on the project. So it's, it's uh, multifaceted. Any other questions? Go on once, go on twice. OK, let's give all four of our speakers another round of applause for some really great presentations. And let me just uh, give a shout out to Monica Kress, who's my counterpart at San Jose State, who has helped with the running of this program and has really, it wouldn't be possible without you. So thank you as well.